All right, let's jump into these sections, 28, 30, 32, and 34, all thematically connected, and they all happen about the, uh, that same time period of that second general conference, with the NC 34 happening about a month later. Um, so, 28 is fun. <laughs> Um, 28 is about this man. This is Hiram Page. Hiram Page is one of the eight witnesses, eight witnesses. of the Book of Mormon, correct? Mm -hmm. um, Hiram Page had a stone that was telling him things. Telling him things about Zion. Telling him ways to build up Zion. And where Zion would be. And he was writing out these revelations, apparently. And uh, none other than Oliver Cowdery, second elder of the church, was believing them. Was like hook, line, and sinker. So was the Whitmer family. Hiram Page was a son-in-law of the Whitmers. He, he married one of the Whitmer daughters. And so the Whitmer family and Oliver Cowdery were like in on this. Like soaking it up, drinking in Hiram Page's revelations that were coming through this stone. Uh, some think they found the stone uh, in the uh, Community of Christ archives. There's a stone, this stone, that, uh, that some believe is the Hiram Page stone because it was wrapped up by an archivist and they wrote on it, the Hiram Page stone. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see kind of where they got that idea. But um, there, is, there is great question as to whether or not that's accurate um, because according to Emer Harris, who was Martin Harris's brother, and Emer Harris named his son, who was born in 1830 when this was happening, Hiram Page Harris. So he probably was pretty closely associated with the facts and liked Hiram Page and knew it. But he said that shortly after DNC 28 was given, the Hiram Page stone was destroyed. It was like broken into pieces and to dust and destroyed. So if that story is true, then my hunch is that that is not the Hiram Page stone uh, as far as that goes. This is more of a uh, in that area, there were these things called Indian gorgettes. This was a, a gorget the Native Americans would, would wear. So these, they put a chain through those holes. They kind of wear it right here, uh, believing some of them they had like some revelatory powers of some kind. Um, there's a few different kinds of these. You'll find these in archives. So for what reason the uh, Community of Christ archivist wrote the Hiram Page stone on it, uh, we can't be we can't be sure. There was a woman who said that she had it that that came through the Whitmer family. Um, and so that's probably just based on the testimony of one lady why that became thought of as the Hiram Page Stone. But that's not the most important part about Section 28. Uh, first of all, if, uh, if a man came along in your ward and started to say, say he stood up uh, in uh, your sacrament meeting and said, I've been having some revelations of late. My stone has been telling me some things. Uh, what would you say is amiss with this? It's not right. Huh? Does that align with doctrine of how revelation happens? Doesn't revelation come through stones? Sometimes. Up to this point. Yeah. Who's the number one like believer in this? Joseph and Oliver. Oliver, right? In in Hiram Page Revelation, Oliver's like, yeah, that's exactly how revelation happens. I watched that happen for a few months. Mm -hmm. So now here's Hiram Page, like, I got revelations too. It's like legit, right? In, in, in our 2018 sensitivity, someone said, I've been getting revelations from my stone. That's when the bishop turns off the microphone and asks them to step down. Right? <laughs> um, but uh, So what's, what's interesting about the story is that the weirdness was not that he was getting revelation from a stone. So like, know the context of these people's world, right? This this magical worldview or, or, or the uh, enchanted worldview, if we don't like the word magic. Uh, is, is very much a part of a lot of people's uh, belief system and that biblical you know, precedent of objects of divine power leading to revelation. That's just like part of a lot of their world. Even though there was some of that time with enlightenment skepticism who were calling into question these things as well. But what they were questioning was not, at least the Whitmers under Calvary, whether the stone was weird. Right? That's not the thing. So let's look at the content of the NC-28. So, what principles does the Lord teach? This is directed specifically to Oliver Cowdery. What does the Lord say to Oliver that basically sets a pattern for the rest of the uh, 
history of the church as far as what we're going to call the, the order, the order of the church. Uh, verse 13 calls it order. All things must be done in order. That's one of the principles. But just kind of skim uh, those verses and teach us what's something about Revelation. So, uh, Steve, you led with that. You said, that's not how Revelation works. Uh, because somewhere in your mind and in your teaching and in your learning, you have learned something that traces itself back to section 28, right? So, what are the principles about Revelation? Just throw some out that you see there. Uh, personal Revelation can come to individuals. Uh huh. But Revelation for the entire church will always come directly through the line of authority. Good. And where do we learn that? Verse 2. Verse 2, right there. No one can receive commandments and revelation to this church except Joseph Smith. He receives them like Moses. And what's. Oh, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry, you, you can come, but like this is so revolutionary in yeah. our organization. Huge. Because up to. Like Joseph is so weird in that he. Weird is the wrong word, but. Like, where everybody else is holding tightly to power, when he establishes the church, he broadly distributes it, runs it through councils, shows basically no interest in being chair of the council. They rotate who heads up the council. Yeah. Um, it's very, like, broadly distributed power. And then, um, and then this revelation comes along and kind of puts him as the, the first among equals, if you will. Yeah. And it, it, it's this... Bushman calls it the conundrum of Joseph Smith's Mormonism, this tension between distributing power and having it yeah. Sorry. centralized. No, but I think this, this is because this is so big on how our church even functions today and the, yeah. the adaptations that we're comfortable making in, in organizational structures, even in the, the changing of the organization of high priests and elders quorum and stuff like that, traces back to this in many ways. Yeah. Our adaptability. Excellent. Sorry. And it all traces back to this section, this instant. This is the precedent, right? Yeah. That, that kicks that off. Good. Other principles you're seeing here? Verse 2 uh, nails that one down. What else? Anything else? Uh, what do we got? 6 through 7, 11 through 13. Is your skimming? 6 through 7, similar idea. Uh, that yeah, Joseph has. You the, don't command the, the leader of the church what to do, he, he gives commandments Good. from God. I like verse 11. So he's, why don't you visit with Hiram one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah. You know, when there's like an issue, it's like, don't like embarrass him or anything. Like, he's probably has good intentions, you know? He like yeah. brings him in one-on-one -on -one and says, hey, just so you know, like, th those are actually from Satan. Yeah. Which brings up a good point. Uh, one of the reasons that Brigham Young was a little nervous about seer stones and Utah people wanted to continue that, as he said, because they could be easily diverted to the devil's cause. You can easily manipulate that. So Brigham Young tries to sort of subdue this in Utah, uh, this idea of objects of divine power, and succeeds, I would say, at that. Uh, yeah, please. So similar to that, I'm wondering your thoughts on, like, one of Brigham's, like, main things coming into the church is speaking in tongues, right? Yeah. And Joseph seems to almost dampen him doing that a little bit at first. He's like, that's good but he kind of restrains it. Is it for a similar way in your perception, or the, for a similar reason? The seer stones are put down? Yeah. Actually. That's a good question, I don't know. Uh, I think so, I think because of people like Hiram Page and others that would claim revelations through seer stones, um, Brigham Young is a little, I mean, he's ready to like, let's knock that off, right? Joseph Smith, apparently someone brought a seer stone to him in Nauvoo, and they asked if it was legit. Is this a legit seer stone? Joseph looked at it and said, yes, but it's been used to do the devil's work, and so I'll have nothing to do with it. Sally Chase, right, she's using a seer stone to actually locate the real location of the plates. Like, she keeps nailing it each time, right? And mm -hmm. she's looking in her hat. Like, so seer stones apparently uh, can be used both for good and for evil. And the Lord acknowledges that. I, I would suspect, I don't know the history of exactly why Brigham Young made those decisions, but I would suspect that swirled around this kind of you know, uh, what would we call it? This kind of uh, mysticism. Yeah, which can lead a lot of people astray, right? So he wants to tighten up the order. So by the time we get to like Joseph uh, F. Smith, he's going to teach stuff like that. Whenever you see a man rise up claiming to have received direct revelation from the Lord of the Church, independent of the order, verse 13, the order and channel of the priesthood, you may set him down as an imposter. So we're teaching this like pretty strong. Um, 
by the time we get to Joseph S. Smith. What are you going to say? I, I have a question. I'm just, like, where, where do we lose that? Is it just the product of culture and scientific revolution and that pattern of doing it? That we, we of lose using that? objects of the Yeah, power? yeah. Like, is it, because, I don't know, they're used throughout the Old Testament, they're used in the New Testament, yeah. right? Yeah, um, we definitely lose it in Utah. And is that just is it because story? of this, or is it just our culture frowns on it? The enlightenment. Yes. Yeah. The rationalism rather than the uh, uh, mysticism or the rash, age of rationalism versus the age of enchantment. Uh, those are definitely in tension, and the further we get in history, the less. The more, I guess we should say, the age of enchantment goes to the fringes. There are still people today. Uh, you know, uh, have you ever seen anyone do water witching? Have you ever heard of this? Yeah. Like, uh, I went to Nauvoo and I saw a guy in Nauvoo. He's one of the senior missionaries. Uh, that on his time off, he would go over to a cemetery, and my wife and I showed up to the cemetery. At the, there's a burial grounds right there, and he had these two rods, and he was walking the cemetery, and I'm like. Whoa, whoa. He's doing this, and I'm like, excuse us, sir, or elder, what, uh, what you doing? He's like, I'm, I'm identifying the graves. A lot of headstones had been uh, been removed, and I'm identifying where they are. I was like, is that, does that really work? And he's like, oh, yeah. I was like, I want to try <laughs> so, so I got him, right? And I started walking. And if I wanted him to, I'd go, and go like that. But I was like, I, was like, I don't think I have the gift. Uh, so, I, but he's like, he's like, he swore by it. He's like, no, I... It, it, it works. He said, watch. And he started doing his thing. Mm -hmm. He's like, right here is this. I was like, have you ever dug down to like verify that? He's like, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but uh, well, I want someone to dig there. But I mean, there's, there's, you know, my, my parents have a, their, uh, there was a cabin uh, that they just sold up in uh, Oakley. And uh, they, they hired a water witch, or uh, his parents did, to come and like, Identified a place for the well. They dug down. There was a well there. And that's how the water to the cabin is. I mean, so these things, these things happen still. Sometimes they, but we call them fringe, right? We call that, that that's fringy, as far as, uh, uh, you know, being mainstream. Even at Joseph Smith's day, that was already on its way out. Right? So by the time we get to our day, it's like no chance. But we do have a strong theology of seer stones, like. Uh, BNC 130 in Revelation chapter 2. Uh, in the celestial kingdom, everyone's going to get a what? Stone. White what stone. color? White. It's going to be white. What will it do? Just tell us all things. It'll tell you on it will be a key word, a new name, and it'll tell you it'll be an instrument of revelation. Right. And we believe that the entire earth is eventually going to become one humongous seer stone. Right. A Urban thumb. We we have a theology of this. Joseph Smith said that there is a seer stone for everybody. Right. Um, but it's because of unbelief and wickedness that we don't currently have. So, I mean, there's a theology of this kind of thing, but I, I do believe that uh, the age of enlightenment and rationalism has drowned out a lot of the belief in those kinds of things. And therefore, they don't work for us, do they? Well, so it speaks to God, uh, God speaking to us the way that we're willing to listen to Him. And that's kind of gone out of fashion or if you will and and uh, you know there, there was a time where dreams were more of the, the of the rage if you will where people are you know getting interpretations of dreams yeah. and revelation that way and, and it still happens for some people yeah. yeah absolutely and I, I think you know different ways that God's that we're willing to accept the way that God's gonna yeah. speak to us but we nowadays we're, we're looking at it more in a different light and we're seeing it in a different way sure. and so God's utilizing those to to speak to his people we are a product of our time, for sure. The one spiritual gift that still works in Mormonism is the gift of healing, correct? So we won't eat it. We use like an object of power. We put olive oil on yeah. someone's head, right? And then we, yeah. and then we do that, and it actually works because <laughs> we believe it still. <laughs> Other the gift of tongues, the speaking, not missionaries going out and teaching, but speaking. All you know, spontaneous. That doesn't spontaneously. Yeah, that doesn't happen. Uh, as much anymore, does it? Yeah. Uh, so, part of it's probably uh, our fault, as much as any. 
I mean, we don't want to point fingers. <laughs> Seems like spiritual gifts. Moroni is pretty adamant, right? It's like, where there is faith, you will find these gifts. So. Um, on this, uh, here's an important question, then we'll move on. Uh, on this, this point, uh, this question comes up a lot in our day, right? It, it, what if I honestly feel different, differently about an issue than the prophets? What if my revelation is different than their revelation? What about that? Can you give me some examples of this being alive and well today? What if my revelation is different than their revelation? What if I feel differently? What if I think they're wrong? Uh, Same about marriage. Uh, yeah, yeah, ton, ton of this uh, with good, faithful members of the church. When we're talking about uh, same-sex marriage, uh, there was a big fallout with when the change happened, right, in the church, when same-sex marriage was legalized in the whole United States, the church leaders had to come to some conclusion as to what do we do with those who are now legally married according to the state, do they have children who are not yet baptized, when can they get baptized, right? And they applied the same rule for them as they did for those who are children in polygamist uh, marriages, right? Uh, a lot of members of the church, well, maybe just loud ones, I don't know, a lot, but a lot, a lot of loud ones uh, on Facebook and other places. They expressed a lot of concern about that, correct? So what do you say to that? And how does section 20 help? What if my revelation is different than their revelation? What if I disagree? If I disagree section. with them? What's that? Which section? 28 here, yeah. 28. Yeah, these principles we've been talking about. What about this? <clears throat> no one shall be appointed to receive commandments and revelations in this church excepting in order. Not at the head. There is an order to these things. Is it okay to feel differently than the prophets about things? Yeah. Is it okay to then proclaim your differences and say that you received them by revelation as well? No. No. Verse That's six. inappropriate. Verse six. So verse 6 tells us. You do not command him. You do not command him who's at the head. Good. So section 28 is actually super, super useful in relevant things today. Let me give you just an example. Let me let a prophet speak. Um, this is about that very issue. It's about a minute and a half. As he's talking about the revelation that was received by the entire form of the 12 and first presidency and him watching President Monson receive the revelation about children of same-sex couples. Have you seen this? It's really good. Uh, I think it illustrates verse 20, or section 28 very well. Listen to this. The first presidency and quorum of the twelve apostles counsel together and share all the Lord has directed us to understand and to feel individually and collectively. And then we watch the Lord move upon the president of the church to proclaim the Lord's will. This prophetic process was followed in 2012 with the change in minimum age for missionaries. And again with the recent additions to the church's handbook, consequent to the legalization of same-sex marriage in some countries, filled with compassion for all, and especially for the children, we wrestled at length to understand the Lord's will in this matter ever mindful of God's plan of salvation and of his hope for eternal life for each of his children. We considered countless permutations and combinations of possible scenarios that could arise. We met repeatedly in the temple in fasting and prayer and sought further direction and inspiration. And then when the Lord inspired his prophet, President Thomas S. Monson, to declare the mind of the Lord and the will of the Lord, each of us during that sacred moment felt a spiritual confirmation. It was our privilege as apostles to sustain what had been revealed to President Monson Revelation from the Lord to his servants is a sacred process. It's pretty good. Pretty good illustration of this, is it not? Very good. So, in, in, I, I would say there's two, probably two good answers to this, this question, right? 
uh, two scenarios. Either A, uh, hold on a little. There's examples of this in like Lorenzo Snow receiving revelation that uh, as as God now is, man may be, and as man now as God once was, that couple. When he shared that with Brigham Young, Brigham Young said, that might be true, brother, but don't you share it. Because that's going to be revealed to the church. It's going to come through Joseph Smith. So he just kind of kept that in for a while. Then when Joseph Smith taught at the King Fall Discourse, then Lorenzo Snow, it's kind of like, yes. And then he could teach it, right, uh, once it came through the president of the church. Uh, 1977 was an interesting time for uh, many. There were patriarchs promising black uh, members of the church that they would eventually have all the promises and blessings of the church or the, of the gospel, even the temple blessings. The next year the revelation would come. But there are those who in 1977 disagree with the current stand of the brethren on that, correct? And so they, uh, they needed to just wait. They just needed to wait. President Kimball, meanwhile, was wrestling and seeking as the head to get the revelation that would be legit for the whole church. No need to rebel against the presidency of the church. No need to fight against them. Just, just wait. Those kind of things have a way of working themselves out. So that's option A. Option A is you're right, so wait. Uh, or option B is you're wrong, right? We all have to be humble enough to recognize that could be the case. We could be wrong. If someone today says, I think that's wrong, the decision that they made, then we say, well, the Lord revealed that to President Monson and the entire Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. So it sounds like on that one you're on your own. Uh, we're not going to get behind you on that. But we stand with the Twelve, right? So sensitive issues uh, which require revelation, and thank God we have people who who fit what section 28 is talking about. We actually have a head. We actually have a president to receive those revelations. Yeah, please. Um, I thought it was interesting last week when that um, man wrote the apology letter about making a big website of what um, president, what the prophet said to, to, to African Americans. And um, it was like you get, yeah, there were multiple things wrong with the letter, but one one was that he said that the church belongs to its members as much to its leaders, but it belongs to God. There you go. And that feels right. Yeah, <laughs> and I love verse 13. It says, like, for all things must be done in order and by common consent in the church by the prayer of faith. When I think of the prayer of faith, I think of, like, um, is it Isaiah 55, 8 through 9? His ways are higher than our ways. Just trusting, submitting our opinions. Um, and our strong feelings to the Lord, because we we do have opinions and strong feelings, yeah. but like being able to submit that and know that He sees the whole thing, yeah, and excellent. it's not it's not I'm not in charge. Perfect, that's great. If there are things amiss in the church, we trust that they'll get worked out. It's not our job ever to call the leaders into question and to tell them that you got to fix this. Up. Brigham Young once he said, I saw. He said, for 30 seconds, I had some question about Joseph Smith's dealings with some financial matters. I questioned him on that. He said, no, it lasted about 30 seconds, maybe a minute. <laughs> he said, well, then I, then I checked myself quickly, and I said, Brigham, if he's wrong, if he's right, that's not your business. Uh, your, your job is not to question whether he's dictated by God and everything he, he uh, uh, does. Your job is to sustain him, and it is God's job to correct him if he's in error. And he said, so he said, that's, I, I switched that fast, and I've never questioned him since. Uh, if, if he's in error, he's God's servant, not mine. So I'll just trust that those things will get worked out. So I love that patience, humility, submission. It's beautiful. Logan? Uh, uh, this last general conference, Elder Anderson talking about uh, President Nelson. Yeah. He said this. Don't be surprised if at times your personal views are not initially in, in harmony with the teachings of the Lord's prophets. These are moments of learning, of humility, when we go to our knees in prayer. We walk forward in faith, trusting in God, knowing that with time we will receive more spiritual clarity from our Heavenly Father. And then he goes on with a little bit more, but that's just kind of... Great. Very yeah. relevant, yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, a related thing here, and the context is the same as section 30, so I'll just, let's just go to 30 for a minute, we'll come back to 28. But in, uh, in 30, I would just uh, I would invite us to be aware of what uh, I'm going to call David Whitmeritis uh, in these various circumstances. So David was taken in by Hiram Page as well. 
Um, Aaron Page was taken in by Aaron Page. I mean, he's not trying to do something rebellious. He just legit was getting revelations from the stone. But uh, check this out. So David Whitmer at this time is 25 years old. And the Lord says in verse 1, a little rebuke, You have feared man and have not relied on me for strength as you ought. Your mind has been on things of the earth. Probably a girl named Julia Ann Jolly. He was kind of in correspondence with her. He's going to marry her eventually. More than on the things of me, your maker, and the ministry whereunto you have been called. You have not given heed unto my spirit and those who were set over you, but have been persuaded by those whom I have not commanded. Hiram Page. So let's break this down. So on the one hand, you have the teachings of those who are set over you. We're talking about now the order of the church. On the other hand, you have the persuasions of those whom I have not commanded. Right? And, and uh, as far as David goes, when push came to shove, this happened multiple times for him, uh, eventually leading to his excommunication, and he never comes back to the church, is that he would go on in the persuasions of those who were not commanded, more so than Joseph Smith, who God had set over him, and who had, uh, with all of his, Joseph's flaws, with all of his weaknesses, uh, he is the man to whom we are to, sub, uh, to submit that during that time period. Um, in patience and in faith, right? Section 21, counsel. So, yeah, David Whitmer, just be aware of that. In this case, he's warned early on in his life, and uh, in three years from now, he will be excommunicated from the church. Uh, that'll happen about 1838. Not three years from now, eight years from now. Eight years from now, uh, that will happen. So, anyway, case study of what not to do. Still talking about the order of the church here. Now go back to section 28 because there's a whole another aspect to this. Uh, it's relevant to the stones. The stones, or the stone, Hiram Page's stone, apparently was talking about Zion, right? And so the Lord, now go to verse 9. Uh, in verse 9, the Lord says, It has not yet been revealed. Nobody knows where the city of Zion is going to be, but I'll give you the hint. It's over on the border by the Lamanites uh, right now. And there's been a lot of interest in the Lamanites, verse 8. Uh, I, I say unto you, Oliver Cowdery, that you shall go unto the Lamanites and preach my gospel unto them. So kind of woven together in this like Hiram Page story, because Hiram Page is bringing up stuff about Zion, the Lord takes this moment to explain that we don't know where Zion is yet, but it's on the border by the Lamanites. In fact, Oliver Cowdery actually wants you to go on a mission to the Lamanites and preach the gospel to them. This uh, now connects to section 30. Again, go to section 30. In section 30, we have, this used to be several revelations, Joseph combined them in 1835, but in verse 5, but in verse 5, Peter Whitmer Jr., who's 21 years old at this time, is commanded to take his journey with your brother Oliver to preach the gospel uh, to the Lamanites and to give heed to your brother, Oliver Calvary, or brother in the law, as it will be, uh, as Oliver marries into the Whitmer family. Uh, then over in verse 9, uh, Let's see, uh, John, no, uh, disregard verse 9, sorry. <laughs> now go over to section 32. Section 32, we get uh, a fellow by the name of Parley P. Pratt, who is called, he's 23-year-old convert of one month. Parley P. Pratt is also told in verse 2 to go with my servants Oliver Cowdery and Peter Whitmer Jr. And also verse 3, a guy named Ziba Peterson. These are going to be our four missionaries to the Lamanites, Oliver, Peter, Harley, and Ziba. And the Lord says, I will go with you and be with you in your midst as you go to preach the gospel to the Lamanites. So, in the midst of this, this mission to the Lamanites, right here, that's going to happen shortly after this conference. So these revelations, all three of these revelations, are relevant, calling these four men, ultimately, to go on this mission to the Lamanites, which will commence in October, and uh, will go through February 1831. Uh, so, why the interest in the Lamanites? Why are people suddenly interested in this and want to go? Is it just come out of the air, Lord, and just bring up the Lamanites? Uh, this came because people have been reading the Book of Mormon. <laughs> and the Book of Mormon keeps talking about them. In the very title page is written to the Lamanites, as well as to Jew and Gentile. Uh, in DNC 3, the Lord had said that the Lamanites might know the promises these plates have been preserved. DNC 10, the prayers of the ancients were such that the Lord covenanted to bring forth the gospel to the Lamanites, the brethren. And so on the mind of members of the church, particularly Parley P. Pratt uh, and Zyba Peterson, 
They want to know, where are they, and when can we do this? When can we take the gospel to them? Harley Parker Pratt. Uh, as he comes on the scene as a 23-year-old convert here uh, of one month, uh, we need to tell his story a little bit to really appreciate what's going to happen next in the history of the church. This changes everything. This is great. So he, uh, he took to religion quickly. He grew up not with a, a great education, but he was a quick mind, studied the Bible, uh, loved the Bible, uh, moved to Ohio, and set up a little place for himself. Uh, but then he thought, I would like to have a wife in my little place in Ohio, the wilderness there. So he went back to New York and found this girl that he was interested in. It turns out she was interested back. They got married and they moved back to the wilderness in Ohio, about 30 miles from Cleveland. Uh, in the midst of that, as he's just studying the Bible, a man by the name of Sidney Rigdon uh, had come along and started teaching out of the Bible faith, repentance, and baptism. Uh, and he's like, hey, that sounds a lot like the Bible. And uh, Sidney Rigdon was part of a group of Alexander Campbell, sometimes called the Campbellites or the Disciple Church. Father P. Pratt joins the Disciple Church. And uh, loves almost everything about it. He says the one thing about it that was kind of seems still still slightly off is that where did they have authority to baptize? He said well, I was kind of willing to kind of sweep that one around uh, out under the rug because everything else they were teaching was awesome. Uh, their philosophy was if the Bible speaks on it, we speak on it. If the Bible the Bible is silent, we're silent. He's like I like that. So he felt inspired to like leave everything and become a preacher for the Campbellites. And so he told his wife about this. He said, let's start in New in, back in New York. Let's start with my family. And so they, uh, they went up to the, the uh, you know, they were living right about down here. They went through Lake Erie to the Erie Canal. And they got on the Erie Canal. And as, as they started on a little boat heading over to New York, he says this, I inform my wife that notwithstanding our passage being paid through the whole distance, well, that's the church history coming to life. <laughs> um, he said, yet I must leave the boat and her to pursue her passage to our friends while I would stop while in this region. Why, I did not know, but so it was plainly manifest by the Spirit to me. The Spirit prompted him right about here, get off the boat. So on the next stop, he got off the boat in Newark. And he bids his wife goodbye. And he says, I'll see you in, back, back in Canaan, where they live. And he didn't know what the world he was doing. So in Newark, Newark he gets off the boat and he just starts walking. And uh, and he says, he bumps into people and says, I'm a preacher. I'd like to preach in this area. And they're like, great. You're a preacher, huh? He gets to preach one evening. Next uh, next day, someone says, you're a preacher. You heard about the gold Bible. He's like, ah, if someone down the road's got it. It's, it's been printed. Now you can look at it. Uh, and then Parliament of Craft, Book of Mormon come into contact. It's this moment of destiny, right? Mm -hmm. Where he reads it, uh, just, just, you know, sleep was a burden, he says. And eating was a burden. I just, he just devoured the Book of Mormon all night. Doesn't sleep the whole night reading it. It's like I gotta know more. Someone said you can find out more in Palmyra. So he heads on over to Palmyra, meets Oliver Cowdery, and uh, that's gonna lead to his baptism. Uh, he then says, My family needs to know about this. He heads on over to Canaan. He tells his whole family about it. And they're like, That's pretty cool. But one of them thought it was really cool, and that was his little brother named Orson. Orson Pratt. Uh, he's 19 when he joins the church. Harley is 23, like I said. He says, my father, mother, and many others believe the truth in part, but my brother Orson, a youth of 19 years, receives it with all of his heart, was baptized at that time, and has ever since spent his days in the ministry. So Orson comes back with Parley. They eventually meet Joseph Smith when they meet at that September conference. Section 34 was given to Orson Pratt, who had been baptized now for, uh, what, six weeks? Uh, Section 34 says, is Orson Pratt going to have any influence on the church? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, these two actually are some of the biggest doctrinal heavy hitters. Uh, they'll take what Joseph Smith's revelations say, and they'll sort of systematize them into kind of a, not a fully systematic theology, but pretty close to the closest we've got as Mormons. Uh, Parley B. Pratt will will uh, he'll write several very influential books, missionary tracts, uh, Voice of Warning, um, and what's the other one? Sign key uh, theology. Some um, key science. Yeah, something about a key in science and theology. <laughs> uh, and uh, Orson Pratt, I mean, these, these are free-thinking men. They'll take this and then they'll just kind of, they'll play with it. Sometimes Orson Pratt was a little too uh, thoughtful or, or uh, exploratory with the doctrine. We've had five proclamations into the church given. 
uh, to the world. One of them was about Orson Pratt. Uh, Brigham Young's like, the doctrine that Orson Pratt is teaching about the Holy Spirit is false. And it was signed by like, all the form of the Twelve. Uh, and, then, and then he uh, he apologized to the church for that. Anyway, so, uh, but he was very thoughtful. Just I mean, just explored every aspect of everything about our theology that he could. Uh, he's going to be in charge of putting together the Doctrine and Covenants. The reason we have Section 34 in here is, uh, you know, actually I think it was already in here, but it gets put in chronological order by him with another 25 sections of the Doctrine and Covenants in 1876. Uh, he says that Joseph put a stone in a hat and looked in that, and that's how section 34 came. So one of the last ones that were received through the Yerman Thumb uh, in the Doctrine of Covenants. Anyway, was meanwhile, true? back. Was what? true? Was what true? That he did put his stone in a hat, was he just saying? Uh, that's what he said. Do you believe him? I don't know, you kind of said it like, and you That's what he said, yeah. So, so that's one of the last ones. That's one of the very. <laughs> sorry, no, I believe Orson Pratt. Right. Uh, that's he's one of the last uh, ones to mention the, that Joseph received it through the Urim and Thummim. Right. The early revelations are always, almost always, right? He received it through the Urim and Thummim. This is one of the last ones. All right, so let's talk now specifically about the actual mission to the Leylands because this this changes everything. This mission was it a success? This mission. To the Lamanites, did they convert a bunch of Native Americans over here on the border of the United States, which at that time was Missouri, the west side of Missouri, mm -hmm. right across the Missouri border. This is all unorganized territory that the uh, Native Americans were in. Was this mission a success? Not in the sense of Lamanite converts. Yeah, interesting. Not in the sense of, of that. Uh, in what sense then was it a success? People didn't talk to you along the way. Yeah, shoot. Yeah, right here. This. That's why it's a success. Um, Parley B. Pratt, as they're heading down toward the Lamanites, uh, this is now uh, in October, like I said, um, he says, we need to stop by my old friend Sidney Rigdon's house and uh, tell him what we're up to. So as these four men came into Kirtland, uh, they looked for Sidney. He was over in Mentor. Ohio, perfect name for Sidney Rigdon, probably be Pratt's relationship. Uh, so he goes over to Mentor, finds Sidney Rigdon, gives him the Book of Mormon, and uh, Sidney says, I'll read it. Meanwhile, they start preaching up a storm in Kirtland, and uh, here's one of the, the, the Northern Ohio newspaper from this time period. They said, strange as it may appear, it is an unquestionable fact that this singular sect have within three or four weeks made many proselytes in this county. The number of believers in the faith in three or four of the northern townships is said to exceed 100, among whom are many intelligent and respectable individuals. That's the weird part. Very smart, intelligent, respectable people are joining the church. This church. This prospects of obtaining still greater numbers in this uh, county is daily increasing. So there were just a ton of people there that were ready, prepared by Sidney Rigdon uh, to join the church, unbeknownst to Sidney Rigdon. Let's look at a few of these. Uh, do any of you guys know Rich Robbins? I like this phrase for this. He calls this Parley's preaching and Rigdon's ripples. Um, uh, here is here's what happens. So, um, so Sidney had as members of his congregation uh, a man named Frederick G. Williams, who's the Kirtland Justice of the Peace. He'll eventually become second counselor of the first presidency. Uh, Newell K. Whitney, a successful store owner there in Kirtland. He and his wife Elizabeth have been praying for years to obtain the Holy Ghost. Uh, he'll become the second bishop of the church. Levi Hancock, carpenter, cabinet maker, distant cousin of John Hancock, who signed the declaration. One of the first presidents of the Quorum of the Seventy, all members of Sidney Rigdon's congregation. Uh, also, Zebedee Coltrane taught the gospel by Levi Hancock's brother. He becomes one of the presidents of this Quorum of the Seventy. Isaac Morley, prominent landowner there in Kirtland, has ties to the Newell K. Whitney store. He consecrates his farm for saints who are moving to New York. Um, great man, Isaac Morley. Lyman White, a Rigdon believer, close friend of Isaac Morley, becomes a fearless apostle. In Liberty Joe with Joseph, uh, Lyman White, he's one that someone pulled a gun on him and said, deny Mormonism, and he unbuttoned his shirt and said, shoot and be damned. Uh, <laughs> fearless apostle. Uh, the guy did not shoot, by the way. Uh, Lyman White Stallion. He will uh, leave the church after Joseph Smith's death. Uh, 
Edward and Lydia Partridge. He's a hat maker. He'll become the first bishop of the church. Huge impact in the sections we're going to study uh, this afternoon and next time. John and Julia Murdoch. He was a dissatisfied member of Rickton's congregation. He'll serve nine plus missions. He'll be a bishop and a patriarch in the church. He'll give his twins to Joseph and Emma when his wife dies, giving birth, and Emma's twins die. Uh, that's so he basically, yeah, so tightly connected to the Smith family. We don't have a picture of Sidney and Elizabeth Gilbert, but he's a business partner with Noel K. Whitney. Nieces, uh, you maybe heard of Mary Elizabeth Rollins and Caroline Rollins. Uh, they say the Book of Commandments in Missouri. Mary will become one of Joseph Smith's plural wives. Uh, we're just getting warmed up. Then there's the Johnson family. John and Alice Johnson, who just lived just out of Kirtland in a place called Hiram, Ohio. He's a wealthy farmer, owner of the Kirtland Inn. Joseph and Emma will live in his home in Hiram. Many revelations will be received there. We've already talked about one of them. The NC1 was received there. They have nine children, two of which children become apostles. Luke Johnson becomes a member of the original Corn of the Twelve, and Lyman Johnson. And uh, Orson Hyde married into the Johnson family, married Marinda Johnson. He worked for Newell K. Whitney as a Campbellite preacher. Um, or sorry, worked for Newell K. Whitney, and he was a Campbellite preacher. Newell K. Whitney was not. He was a store owner. Um, he actually, there's a little bunk. He had a little bunk up in the store. Um, he becomes a member of the original Quorum of the Twelve. He'll be the one that dedicates the Holy Land. Um, it was said of High, uh, Orson Hyde that he had the entire Bible memorized, verse for verse. He could read any verse of the scripture, and he could quote the one before and the one after it. Just like a photographic memory. He was an orphan kid, but just incredible mind. Um, but wait, there's more. Uh, the Johnson family knew uh, the family, uh, what were their names? Oliver and Rosetta Stone. Uh, is her name really Rosetta Stone? Oh, That's good. Right. Oh, uh, it's Snow, actually. I don't know. <laughs> just, rolled, just rolled off the tongue. Uh, Oliver and Rosetta Snow, they had some kids. <laughs> Sorry, don't teach them. Uh, they had some kids. Eliza R. Snow, had heard of her. Friend of the Johnson family, future Relief Society president, future plural wife of Joseph Smith. She had a little brother, not really interested in religion. Uh, but she said, just come and listen to Joseph. He talks, there's a Hebrew school that he's teaching too. He's like, can you move? Like, yeah. uh, his name is Lorenzo Snow. Uh, he's uh, you know, going to become the fifth president of the church. Uh, they have a cousin named Erastus Snow, who was taught by Orson Pratt and Luke Johnson. Uh, he becomes one of the most revered apostles of his day. And later, by the way, uh, he knocks on the door of a girl named Nancy McCurdy who then uh, joins the church, moves to Nauvoo. She marries a guy named James Woodward, and they're my direct, like, grandparent, great-great-grandparents. So I, I'm like an effect of the Rigdon's Ripples part of these preaching here. Am I grateful for the Lamanite mission? I am. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this is, there's, there's more to this, right? But uh, uh, this highlights a super cool principle that I think is worth pondering just for a second. Mm -hmm. um, Elder Maxwell has a cool phrase. He talks about the Christmas star. Uh, and he says, The same God that placed that star in a precise orbit millennia before it appeared over Bethlehem in celebration of the birth of the babe has given at least equal attention to the placement of each of us in precise human orbits so that we may, if we will, illuminate the landscape of our individual lives so that our light may not only lead others but warm them as well. Uh, another quotation about human orbits, that God has placed each of us in an ordained orbit. And I think one of the coolest places in, in the whole scriptures to show this is this mission, the Lamanite mission. Right? Is it coincidental that all these people, this high concentration of highly intelligent and respectable people who were ready for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be preached in his fullness, were just all happened to be in that little area, um, who would then become some of the movers and shakers for the entire first generation of the church that affected your life and my life, and they were all like right there. And the Lord says, yeah, if you're interested in the Lamanite mission, yeah, I want you to go and preach to the Lamanites. Yeah, why don't you go down there? Um, he didn't bring up Kirtland, he didn't bring up any of that, but that's where the real harvest happened. Uh, did the Lord know this? Were those people placed there way in advance? I believe so. Um, you can think about divine orbit moments in your own life, you know, where you're at, why you're here. Um, the people who affected the people who affected you. You just see you just see God's hand in this, and it's a good discussion to have to talk about divine orbit moments uh, in your life, in the life of your family, family history. Uh, but we won't do that right now, because that's not what we're for. We're not going that high in the uh, fundamentals, right? We're just <laughs> stopping right there. Uh, that's what I like to I like to have that discussion. 
with my students right here. Uh, so, thoughts, comments, questions about this before we wrap up this segment? Uh, the Lamanite mission. Anything about that? Yeah, Michael? You just said the name of that congregation that Sydney was, they were called the Campbellite. Campbellites, yeah. Campbellites? Yeah. Named after Alexander Campbell, who was Sidney Rigdon's mentor. And this was the same one that um, said it was really purely taught from the Bible. The Bible says it, yeah, we say it. Exactly, right? yeah. Very Bible based, uh, which is why it was so attractive to so many Bible loving people. It's like, that's exactly what the Bible says. Cool. It seems like the Lord really used that to bring a lot of prepared people. Yeah, that's cool. Absolutely, yeah. yeah those whose hearts resonated with the, that biblical message uh, were ready for the restoration. Absolutely. Yeah. Good comment. Good question. Any other earth thought, Brian? Good comment. Okay. Awesome. Well, we will uh, end the segment right there.